Welcome everyone to Joy Wellness Partners. Um, today we're doing our Lunch and Learn on hormones, uh, which is something we specialize here uh, in the clinic. And um, we've got some amazing presenters today that are going to take you through a lot of great information. And um, hopefully you learn some stuff. And if not, hopefully you contact us with uh, more questions. So um, I'll give you a quick introduction here of who you're going to be listening to today. Um, today, we have Dr. Allison Mulcahy, MD. She's a board certified uh, emergency physician since 2006. She received her doctorate from the University of Nevada School of Medicine, as well as completing a two year fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. She founded her own integrative and regenerative medicine clinic in Idaho in 2018. Dr. Mulcahy is the supervising physician here at JWP, and we are so grateful that she has brought her extensive knowledge and experience to our clinic. Her attention to detail combined with her willingness to share her expertise with clients and staff has allowed us to grow as a company. Her kindness and intelligence, along with her calming presence, makes her an asset to our team here at Joy Wellness Partners. So we're very lucky to have her here with us. Um, also joining Dr. Mulcahy today is Dr. Ryan McNally, who is a dual licensed naturopathic doctor and physician assistant with 13 years of integrative uh, medicine experience and the last four years specializing in regenerative medicine. He earned his uh, degrees at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine and Northeastern University and completed his residency at the Yale University Griffin Hospital University at Bridgeport Integrative Medicine Residency Program. That's a mouthful. He was a professor of medicine and chief medical officer at Bastyr University before going into private practice. Having Dr. McNally on our team is a benefit to our clients' health and wellness journeys. His caring and personalized approach to each client's experience has quickly elevated him to an integral part of our team. His vast knowledge of internal medicine and optimizing health through each stage of life has further educated our staff. We consider ourselves very fortunate to have him as a part of our JWP family. So we're very happy to have you both here today. And we'll start with um, Dr. Mulcahy, if you're ready. Awesome, thanks so much for the kind intro. And I echo that I feel very lucky to be working with all of you. So what we're gonna be talking about today is hormones. Um, we're gonna try and cover hormones in the next 20 minutes or so. <laughs> so, so, so strap on your seatbelt. Um, <laughs> the first thing that I'd like everyone to do is uh, put in the chat box, the first thing that you think about when you think of hormones. It's nice to always uh, do a little check-in before and after um, to, to hopefully solidify a little bit of learning as we go through all this. What we're going to cover, we're going to have two parts. I'm going to do the first part and then Ryan will do the second part. And I'm going to do kind of a 35,000 foot view of hormones, talk about what is what are hormones, why are hormones important, how can we optimize our hormones, and then a very, very brief overview of sex hormones, adrenal hormones, thyroid hormones, and melatonin. And then Dr. McNally is going to uh, do a brief intro to hormone replacement therapy. And he's gonna talk about specifics of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone hormone replacement therapy. He's gonna talk about contraindications and safety. And then we're gonna leave some time at the end for some questions. So what, what the heck are hormones? So hormones are basically compounds that are secreted from endocrine glands that act uh, on other organs or tissues throughout the body. And there, we have tons and tons of hormones. We're only gonna talk about a small percentage of them here. Um, but if you look at the, these diagrams here, um, the lower left-hand corner there, the cell is gonna produce a hormone, the hormone's gonna go through the blood and then it's gonna act on all different parts in the body. Where are they made? How are they made? Um, organs basically take up some cholesterol and then they convert it locally into hormones. And, and the different organs that we're gonna talk about today are the testes, ovaries, thyroid, adrenals, and the pineal. And why are they important? So hormones affect organs and tissues throughout our entire bodies. So if we don't have optimal hormones, it's gonna affect everything throughout our body. Libido, strength, health measures such as blood pressure, heart rate, risk of cancer, risk of heart disease, hunger, cognition, energy and mood, sleep, lots of other things that I haven't even mentioned, but these are some of the big ones. And I think it's important, we talk about this a lot in the 
integrative and functional and naturopathic medicine world that we're not looking for normal ranges, we're looking for optimal. So this cartoon kind of shows that, you know, we have this giant range of what's, you know, quote, normal. Um, and what we want is optimal. We're not chasing numbers. We want everyone to feel good. And so you might, you know, go to your doctor and they might say, hey, your thyroid hormone is normal. It might be normal, but you might feel crappy like that woman in the picture. So what we're looking for is optimal. So how the heck do we optimize our hormones so that we can feel good? It's, it's not so simple, which is why, um, why it's important to have teams like we have at Joy Wellness Partners to look into it. So I always like to think of the root causes of things. Um, and, and this we've talked about this with microbiome and, and other things, but it certainly applies for hormones. If we don't have optimal health at the foundation, it's gonna mess up everything, including hormones. We can band-aid things. So, you know, if I have low thyroid hormone, I can take thyroid hormone to make sure that I have optimal levels of thyroid hormone while I figure out what is causing my thyroid hormone to be low. Certainly some hormones as we get older are just going to be lower and we're going to need to replace, but we always want to work to figure out what's making the hormones low to begin with. It's also important to think about the fact that hormones are actually regulated by our brain. And so the hormones are produced in our endocrine glands, but then our brain actually tells the glands whether they should produce more or less of the hormones. And so I'm gonna show you a little scary diagram here. Um, and it's not so scary, but it does look a little overwhelming. And you can just see at the top is the hypothalamus and that's in our brain. And then right below it is the pituitary gland, which is also in our brain. And then you can see all those hormones that get released from the pituitary that go out to all the different endocrine organs that then, then produce the, or, the hormones that we're talking about today. Some of the ones that we're talking about today. And so you can see it's a pretty complicated process. And then there's, there's feedback loops. So depending on what levels of hormones we have, it's going to either tell our brain, hey, we should produce more, or we should produce less. Sometimes the feedback mechanisms don't work right. And sometimes our brain tells us to keep producing more, even though we have plenty or vice versa. And so that's where kind of getting to the root cause is important. We don't want to just, you know, irradiate someone's thyroid because they're not producing um, or they're producing too much thyroid hormone. We want to figure out like, why is that going on? And oftentimes by getting to the root cause, we can help people to have optimal hormones without uh, anything drastic. I'm going to show one more diagram here, which is also a little bit overwhelming to show how we can intervene specifically with sex hormones. You're not going to be able to see all the different little boxes here, but the point is, if you look at the whole picture here of what's happening with our hormones, each of the different pathways has things that are gonna impact whether you're gonna have more or less. And so we talk a lot about testosterone replacement therapy. So if you go to the right side here, if we, if we have too much obesity, too much inflammation, insulin resistance, things like that, we're gonna be more likely to convert testosterone to estrogen. And that is gonna cause unwanted side effects. And so that's just one little, one little area in this diagram that illustrates what we're thinking of whenever we're working to optimize someone's hormones. So we're gonna to work to figure out, okay, what lifestyle things are gonna improve your hormones. And I always think about the four pillars, the four pillars of health whenever we're optimizing anything with health. The first one, and that I think is such a foundational pillar is sleep. So making sure that our sleep is good. If our sleep is not adequate, our hormones are not gonna be optimal. Diet, we wanna have an anti-inflammatory diet. There's lots of different ways to do this. Our standard American diet with lots of processed foods and industrial seed oils is incredibly inflammatory. And that's gonna cause the hormones to sometimes go into the directions of, of the hormones that we don't want that are potentially more carcinogenic and dangerous instead of the hormones that are beneficial and make us feel good. Stress, St who has not had stress this year? This year has been kind of a crazy year and stress affects everything in our body, including our hormone levels. So by optimizing our stress, we're gonna also improve our hormone levels. Exercise, it's important with exercise that we have both endurance and strength training, particularly with androgenic hormones such as testosterone. If we're not doing any sort of strength training, that's gonna be hard to optimize our uh, androgenic hormones such, such as testosterone. Also important to realize though that with all these things, there's an important uh, optimal dose. So much like medicine, exercise has an optimal dose. If we don't do enough of it, we're not gonna get the benefit. 
if we do too much of it, we're not going to get the benefit. So I, you know, I get people that do way too much exercise and their hormones are not optimal for that reason. And inflammation, we've talked about inflammation before and uh, the term inflammaging, that inflammation pretty much contributes to aging and all diseases. And so anything that we can do to reduce our inflammation is going to help us to optimize our hormones and optimize our overall health. And inflammation is not bad per se. Um, it's just when we're living with chronic inflammation that can affect all these metabolic processes. Anything that disrupts the hormone pathways uh, is going to impact our hormones. So we, we hear a lot about hormone disrupting, hormone disruptors, um, common ones that you can see in these diagrams here are things like pesticides, plastic water bottles, lots of uh, products that we use for, you know, washing our hair, skin, face, et cetera. Lots of those have things like parabens, which are actually quite dangerous and can uh, disrupt our hormones. Um, lots of cleaning supplies, cosmetics, believe it or not, scented candles can be one of the biggest contributors. And so, you know, if someone is, is burning a bunch of scented candles in their house, that might be messing up their estrogen levels. And, and if we don't ask those questions, we would never know. And that's why we often ask pretty comprehensive questionnaires. You might wonder why if you're just coming in for testosterone therapy, why we're asking what types of cosmetics you use. And, and it's because if we don't consider all that, we're not gonna optimize you as well. Let's talk briefly about the different types uh, of hormones that we're gonna cover today. And, and as I mentioned before, there's lots of other hormones, but these are just kind of a small uh, subset that we work with frequently and help, help people to feel better and heal better. Sex hormones are the first group. And we're gonna talk about adrenal hormones, thyroid hormones, and melatonin. And a lot of times we get people coming in with musculoskeletal injuries. And if people aren't healing well, a lot of the times the root cause of that is that their hormones aren't optimal. So a lot of times we'll tell people, hey, why don't you go over and get your hormones checked and maybe your testosterone levels are preventing you from healing. So the three sex hormones that we're gonna cover are estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Dr. McNally is gonna cover them in more detail. I'm just gonna do a very quick gloss over here. So estrogen, the, the primary form of estrogen um, that is the most metabolically active is estradiol. That's produced primarily in the ovaries. And there's some that's produced converted from DHEA and testosterone. And on this little diagram on the right, this, this is a blow up of the diagram I showed earlier. And all I wanted to point out here is that if we have things like we're smokers, if we're, we have a high sugar diet, if we're, um, if we have a lot of inflammation, if we're, um, exposed to pesticides, what's going to happen is our estrogens are going to convert into the more dangerous forms of estrogen. So as we metabolize estrogen out of our body, there's kind of the, the more safe estrogens. And then there's the more dangerous ones that, that make us susceptible to having DNA damage and uh, potentially developing cancer. And so what we always want to do, and Ryan's going to talk about this more, is we always want to make sure that we're pushing our estrogens towards the healthy estrogens, um, and making sure that we minimize the unhealthy estrogens. Testosterone, um, we always think about testosterone with men. We know it's produced in the testes. But it's actually also very important in women as well and produced in the ovaries and the adrenals. And Dr. McNally is gonna talk much more about testosterone as well. But again, just briefly, when we look at the pathways here, testosterone is gonna push more towards estrogen with high inflammation, obesity, and so, if someone's on testosterone replacement therapy and we wanna minimize them converting to estrogen in addition to medicines that we can give people, we can also offer lifestyle suggestions that can help keep the testosterone in the active form that's gonna make people feel better. Progesterone's the next one. So progesterone's made in the ovaries for the most part and a little bit in the adrenals as well. And the thing I wanna point out here is high blood sugar, too much insulin, is gonna push pregnenolone so that we don't have enough progesterone. Progesterone is a really relaxing hormone. Um, it helps, helps us to sleep. And Dr. McNally is gonna talk more about that. Adrenal hormones, a couple of them, cortisol and DHEA. So everyone's heard of cortisol. Cortisol is kind of our stress hormone. It's amazing, we need it, but most of us are a little too ramped up um, and have too much cortisol too much of the time. And if you look in this diagram here, it's going to cause us to have increased blood pressure, increased heart rate. Um, and it just kind of causes our entire nervous system to be ramped up more 
that it needs to be. So we want cortisol, but we want, we don't want too much of it. And then we also want to make sure that we have not too much of the active form. So again, kind of, this is another instance where if we have too much insulin resistance and inflammation, what's going to happen is the cortisol is going to be higher than the cortisone. And the cortisol is the actual active form of the hormone that's going to kind of make us feel ramped up. And we need cortisol. We, our cortisol levels go up first thing in the morning and help us get going. But if it's high all the time, uh, it, it's actually quite harmful for our bodies and it makes it hard to heal. And then the little diagram on the right just kind of gives another picture of kind of how everything is related. So if we have stress coming into our brain, our hypothalamus then tells our pituitary which then tells our adrenal gland, hey, we're under stress. We need to produce some more of these stress hormones like the DHEA and cortisol. Um, over a long period of time, we can have feedback mechanisms that are messed up as well. So you get people that have been under stress for so long that they don't produce enough cortisol anymore and then they feel really low energy. So this is something we always wanna look at to optimize when we're, when we're looking at optimizing people's health, whether it's hormones or injuries or whatever. DHEA, um, another very important adrenal hormone, and it's important for the immune system. It helps with bone health. It also improves mood and it also decreases visceral fat, which more and more studies are showing that visceral fat is, the percentage of visceral fat is directly correlated with aging. And so uh, more and more we're realizing that we can actually impact aging um, through various ways. And this is one way with optimizing hormones. This is just another example where inflammation and obesity are going to push the DHEA, DHEA to uh, the type of the, the form of the hormone that is not as active. A couple other hormones that I'll just mention briefly are thyroid hormone and melatonin. So thyroid, super important hormone. It, it regulates temperature, metabolism, cerebral function, and energy. And the, the, form of the thyroid hormone that's produced in our thyroid is T4. The active form is T3. And the active form is actually produced in peripheral tissues, primarily in the liver and the gut. And so if we have a bunch of inflammation, we're not going to produce enough T3 and we're going to feel tired. So you might have adequate T4, but not enough T3. So that's something that we also want to look at in terms of optimizing hormones and health. And then melatonin, everyone's probably heard of melatonin as a sleep hormone. It's also amazing for the immune system. And there are lots of studies that show that uh, melatonin actually impacts cancer and reduces the recurrence and uh, improves outcomes. So I think most sleep researchers are taking melatonin. I'm taking melatonin based on the research that I've read. Um, something that a lot of people probably don't know is that the effectiveness and the production of melatonin unfortunately decrease with age. So, so that's something that as we get older, uh, a lot of times people don't sleep as well. We know that sleep is super important for maintaining health and healing. So making sure that that, that important pillar of sleep is optimal uh, helps to optimize everything else. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McNally now, and he's gonna talk about a brief uh, intro to hormone replacement therapy. And then uh, I'll jump back on for some questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Mulcahy for setting us off on the on a, a good, good start point here. Uh, a lot of good, great information. Um, and thank you, Liz, for the introduction. I appreciate all the kind words. Uh, so we'll get started here. Um, and as Dr. Mulcahy, he mentioned at the beginning, this is a short webinar. This, the endocrine system is so incredibly complex. Uh, you know, Dr. Mulcahy has been practicing for many, many years. I've been practicing for many, many years. And there is an endless amount of learning that we continuously do in this area. It, it's just a very big, complicated system. Um, but we've learned a few things over the years, so we're going to share that with you today. Um, so the first thing I'm going to go over is I'm going to go over some of the, uh, the specific hormones and how uh, people experience them, both through the aging process and what happens when we put them back in the body. So really what you should be taking from this is, is what is my lived experience with these different hormones? And when we use them therapeutically, what is my experience going to be with those? So the first one is estrogen. Um, estrogen exists both in men and women, just more so in women. Um, but many men, you know, think of estrogen, well, it's a bad thing. We can't have it in the, in the man's body. It's not true. Estrogen has an important biological role in men as well. We just don't need as much of it as a female. Um, and so the common things that you see with estrogen 
is uh, when a woman goes through menopause and whether that's natural menopause or that's surgically induced menopause, they commonly experience what we call vasomotor symptoms. Um, these are things like hot flashes and sweats and so forth. That's kind of your most classic symptom. And so when we use uh, estrogen, when we do estrogen replacement therapy, usually we can control these with using an estrogen. Um, and it basically pushes you back to where you were when you were in your premenopausal days and the system doesn't have those flushes and fl hot flashes um, at all, or sometimes just far, far less than what you'd experience when you go through menopause. Um, I would say another really, really common one is, um, is vaginal dryness and painful intercourse. And so um, Dr. Mulcahy already talked a little bit about how the estrogens play a role or where they're produced. Uh, and uh, they are super important for making the, uh, the vagina um, basically healthy. All the cells of the vagina uh, you know, need to be lubricated and plump. And what happens is when estrogen levels drop, uh, these cells kind of dry out and it becomes um, uh, less, uh, less easy to have sex comfortably, basically. Uh, it, you also, aside from intercourse, it can play a role in increasing number of infections because the integrity of the tissue is not what it used to be. And so this can be a considerable source of discomfort for a lot of females. And so when we, we can do systemic estrogen and we can do both uh, vaginal, intravaginal estrogen and really kind of bring back the life to the cells and uh, decrease infections in the area and also make intercourse uh, more normal again. Uh, so that's usually a, a really positive piece there. Um, some of the other big ones are going to be um, mood. So it can be anxiety, it can be depression. We do tend to see some uh, mood disturbances when people go through menopause, uh, which can be improved by bringing in and balancing the hormones once again. Um, there's some interesting data on cardio protection. So one of the, one of the theories about why women tend to live longer uh, is the protective effect of estrogen. I can't say that we conclusively know that, but there is definitely evidence out there to support that that, that might be true. Um, and then there's some, also some really interesting information about estrogen being protective um, and, and dementia and Alzheimer's as well. Um, and the last piece I'll mention, probably something that you may have heard of, is the impact of estrogen on bone health. And so as people go through menopause, estrogen levels drop, they are much more likely to develop osteopenia, osteoporosis. And then of course, what we're trying to avoid ultimately is really a fracture, right? Because a fracture in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s can uh, you know, cause a significant amount of, uh, of uh, likelihood of, of a bad outcome, right? And so we wanna try to prevent, prevent that, create good bone health. And estrogen is one, just one piece of the puzzle to creating healthy bone health. Another one is DHEA, which Dr. Mulcahy mentioned already. All right, progesterone. And that is not a comprehensive list. The, the list goes on and on and on. We're just talking about some of the more common ones. Um, progesterone is another important piece. Uh, again, it exists both in men and in women, just uh, uh, higher amounts in, in females. And so progesterone levels have a really important balancing role to estrogen, right? And so they exist in this kind of natural symbiotic relationship. And so uh, when hormone levels drop off in menopause, we often, we, we see estrogen and progesterone level decline. And so one of, one of the common things that you see occur is um, sleep. Sleep starts to become more of an issue. Generally speaking, we think that's at least in part due to progesterone. Um, and you, if you talk to anyone in their 70s and 80s, uh, most will tell you that they don't sleep like they used to, right? The, the term sleeping like a baby, uh, that's that, you know, definitely, um, definitely, you know, conjures the images of a, you know, a sleeping child, very sound and so forth. You may disagree if you have kids at home, but uh, that's, that's kind of where that comes from because as we age, we do tend to have an increased amount of, of sleep issues, smaller amounts of sleep or quantity of sleep, uh, more interruptions in sleep and so forth. And we think at least in part that's due to progesterone. Uh, and then of course, melatonin is another piece of Dr. Mulcahy brought up, which is in a really important hormone. And she did a really nice job hitting some of the highlights there. Uh, and uh, something that I also take, I think it's a fantastic hormone uh, for people. Uh, I, I think a lot of times the challenge is people's expectations is that, that melatonin is going to be a sedative. It's going to knock you out, make you fall asleep. And that's not the way melatonin works. Um, so yeah, progesterone improves sleep. Uh, it also has a really interesting anti-anxiety effect on the body. So we have these GABA receptors in our brain. And when we, uh, when uh, medical uh, you know, clinicians prescribe um, 
uh, uh, benzodiazepines, which are things like Xanax and so forth, it binds to those GABA receptors and creates that sense of calm. Well, interestingly enough, progesterone also binds to GABA receptors in the brain. And so we find that um, uh, progesterone can be a really nice um, uh, anti-anxiety uh, component as well. And so we, we oftentimes see that um, you, you do have to take it orally in order to get the sleep and the anxiety, anti-anxiety benefits. You, you generally are not going to get that if you're using progesterone topically. Um, and then the last piece here where it helps prevent uterine cancer, that's when, that's when estrogen is being used. So when we use estrogen as a therapeutic, if we use that alone, there is an increased risk of, of uterine cancer. But if we do the two of them together, which is the way they exist in, in, in the premenopausal days and, and naturally, uh, then we do get a decreased risk in uterine cancer. So we always, always, always use estrogen and progesterone in combination because we're simply trying to bring people back to where they were in say their 20s, right? We wanna just mimic the earlier days, which were we consider kind of the peak of, of human health. Um, some of the side effects, you know, largely the, the issues with, with progesterone and like most things is dose related. So if you dose inappropriately or you overdose uh, or not overdose, but dose too high, you can have some fluid retention, you can induce some vaginal bleeding uh, and, and so forth. So uh, usually it's just making sure that your dosing is dialed in and maybe going slow and gradually increasing over time is kind of how you prevent side effects overall. All right, testosterone. So another kind of major sex hormone exists both in men and women. You're seeing a theme here. Um, now, testosterone is something um, is something that uh, most people don't realize. I mean, when you think of testosterone, you think of, okay, uh, bodybuilders, you think of guy, you know, men in gyms, right? Big muscles, things like that. But you know, that is, that's the abuse side of testosterone, right? It's really gotten kind of a bad rap. You think of you know, things like uh, anger and rages and things like that. That's, the, that's kind of the dark abuse side of testosterone. When you're using it medically and you're using it appropriately, it can have some really profound impacts on people. And that's what we do here in a part of our medical practice. Um, and so the two big ones I'll point out right away is energy levels and libido. And most people you know, know the libido size. We'll start with energy. So um, we use testosterone all the time with both men and women. And we routinely see that energy levels typically increase. It's one of the most common things that people report back when we start them on testosterone therapy is, wow, I feel like I have more energy. I feel like I have you know, more life in my body. Um, they might notice that they're able to have a bit more uh, stamina throughout their day and be able to, uh, you know, kind of put in, you know, a longer day's work or just, you know, do more of what they need to get done throughout the day uh, rather than kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of pittering out in the, in the early afternoon or mid-afternoon or something. So we do see these impacts um, uh, with on the energy levels that most people really like. Um, it's not like a cup of coffee doesn't make you jittery or anything like that. Um, the libido desire aspect of things, um, that again, again, pretty well known, but we do see periods of time, uh, could be andropause or menopause, it could be prior to that, I mean, there are people in their 30s and 40s who have dips in libido and you measure the testosterone and it's very, very low. And so it can really happen in the age, it just tends to happen or be more likely um, as we get older. Um, but it, testosterone is pretty, pretty um, uh, reliable in terms of an agent that helps to increase libido and kind of bring back that uh, desire and, and just improve overall uh, sexual health. Um, to some degree, it can help with, with um, uh, folks who have erectile dysfunction or, you know, uh, have, you know, a underperforming uh, erection. It, it, sometimes you can get some benefit there. Um, but it, it oftentimes is not quite enough to kind of do what people have if they have a severe form of the disease. Um, let's see, other kind of big ones. Uh, I routinely hear people come back and say that they are now more motivated and want to go engage in exercise. And so we, don't, we know that um, androgens or testosterone have impacts on muscle building, right? That's what it's an anabolic. Uh, it helps to build muscle uh, and actually does help to decrease fat mass. And so um, you know, anything that we can get the ball rolling with someone who, you know, has the desire to want to go exercise, but can't seem to get off the couch, you know, this could be a nice piece to get them moving again and get them back in the gym. And then, you know, later on, they may not even need the testosterone, you know, uh, or they may just decide to stay on it. Uh, but, you know, it, it does have tend to have that motivating effect. And we know how important exercise is for physical health and weight maintenance and, 
and mental health. And so anything that can get people back to a routine exercise, I think is a really positive thing for overall health. Um, testosterone can improve bone strength, uh, much like estrogen. Uh, some people get a, a, a big lift in their mood. Um, some people will report that they have, if they have brain fog or that cloudiness, that, that tends to part and they tend to have more clear uh, thinking. Um, and there is some interesting uh, information or, or data out there to suggest that maybe testosterone may help with memory or, or again, help with kind of dementia and Alzheimer's, although it's not certainly not a cure, same way estrogen is not a cure. Um, a lot of people do report improved sleep with testosterone. Um, and then uh, we oftentimes see joint pain and muscle pain will improve as well with testosterone um, to a certain level, right? It's not going to, if you have a, you know, if you have a hernia disc, it's not going to make the disc herniation go away. But if for just kind of general aches and pains and so forth, oftentimes the pain levels are low with testosterone use. And then there's some really interesting uh, research and there certainly needs to be more done, but it may be helpful for people who are uh, in advanced ages, say 80s, 90s and beyond, uh, who are experiencing muscle decline, you know, so as we age, you know, again, as our ability to move goes down, it hastens our kind of exit. And so anything that we can do to, to maintain strength and mobility and movement uh, through that aging process is really powerful and important. And certainly uh, its ability to play a role in, in frailty and sarcopenia uh, is promising. All right, so I'll move on to next, next one here. Uh, just another comment about men and women with testosterone. You know, I, when the first time I heard this, I couldn't believe um, that estrogen was the dominant sex form in a, in a female. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Of course, it's estrogen. Uh, and this is, you know, this is well after my training. And uh, so when I heard that at a conference, I went home and I pulled up, naturally, uh, I don't trust anybody, so I have to go do the research myself. And I pulled up some of my patients' labs and I looked at the estrogen and testosterone levels. Now, when they are reported in labs, they are not in the same units. So you actually have to go through and convert the units into the same unit to compare apples to apples. And so I went through that painful process, did a little bit of math, and lo and behold, testosterone is three to four times higher in females than estrogen levels. And most people don't realize that. So, you know, it's not a man's hormone. It has an important biological function in both men and women. And we treat men, both men and women here at Joy Wellness uh, with really good results uh, in, in both sexes. Okay, um, this is just a little diagram here. I, I like this because it kind of illustrates, you know, the, the lifespan uh, and, and uh, pictorially here and shows where we start to see some of the declines in, uh, in our hormones. And most people think, okay, 50s, you know, is when, when things start to decline. Well, the, the reality is that's, that's not true at all. Uh, the, the common place where hormones start to dip is going to be in your early 30s, right? You'll start to see some small changes in hormone levels. And the, the, the challenging thing is most people don't have their hormones tested when they're younger, so they don't have comparative values. Uh, but if you happen to have that, you'll see that, you know, maybe when you were 20, your testosterone level was, say, thousand and now you're 35 your testosterone level is 500 right uh and, and so and, and you're only 35 it's not not very old and so uh you know and so things move quicker than people realize um that's kind of the point here and so you know i think it does make sense if people are struggling with any of the symptoms that can be related to hormones that they get evaluated even if they are in their 30s or 40s because there might be something there um lastly i'll mention here that um while Hormones are certainly not a cure for the aging process. We know it does play a role in the quality of life. And so um, there's a lot of controversies in hormones and I'm gonna kind of go through the safety parts um, uh, because you know, so far I painted a very rosy picture and, and I, I do feel like it's, it's positive overall, but there are some concerns and I'll show you how we kind of um, both watch those and mitigate those concerns. All right, so amazing. Why isn't everyone doing this? Uh, the answer to that is, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that there's a lot of misinformation out there with healthcare providers. So um, not everyone uh, really studies this area. They could be an amazing health, uh, health provider, uh, healthcare provider, but, but may not be up to date in this particular area. There is a vast amount of information out there nowadays, and you can't know everything, even if you are an incredibly intelligent person. And so it's important to go to somebody who is up to date on this because you can really be thrown with different medical opinions because there are many providers still to this day who would tell you, do not take hormones, they're gonna give you cancer or do not take hormones, you're gonna have a heart attack. And the reality is while nothing is risk-free, we, we really know how to do things in a very safe way these days and we know how to mitigate the risks that are there. 
Um, and so here's the first thing. This is probably not something that most people know. This is specifically with testosterone. So testosterone, uh, under normal circumstances, even when your body is creating it yourself, will interact with your kidneys. And it turns on a hormone or, or encourages a hormone to be produced in your kidneys called EPO or erythropoietin. Now, erythropoietin goes from the kidneys into your bone marrow and turns on red blood cell pr uh, production. And that will increase the number of red blood cells in your hemoglobin hematocrit. And that's an important uh, kind of feedback mechanism. Uh, we do oftentimes find that elderly patients have low red blood cells and hemoglobin hematocrit, even if their iron and B12 and folate are normal. And so one of the reasons we think is because testosterone is dipping and you're not getting that, that you're not stimulating EPO to be produced in order to kick the bone marrow into gear. And so when we supplement testosterone, when we give testosterone to somebody who, uh, who you know, has symptoms of low, low testosterone, we always watch for an increase in red blood cells above the normal range because we're not going for above normal range uh, with red blood cells. Um, it can be therapeutic if you're much older and your red blood cells are low, but if you're, you know, say in your 40s or 50s, your red blood cells may be perfectly normal. And so we give you testosterone to replace the low values and your hemoglobin, hematocrit, red blood cells may go above the normal range. So the first thing is, is that unsafe? To this day, and to my knowledge, there is not a single paper that shows that that is actually unsafe. Now, there is theoretical concern in that, and that is the reason why we treat it, uh, because there is a genetic disease called spherocytosis, which is characterized by an increase in red blood cell count, which does, which is, has nothing to do with testosterone, uh, but that does uh, create a pro-thrombotic uh, environment, meaning there could be clots, uh, venous thrombosis, and so forth. And so because there is a different disease that has a similar characteristic, uh, you know, we, we just take a, a, a precaution and we will have someone go donate blood if their red blood cell counts are too high. So it's really simple to treat. Um, there's no, we don't necessarily even technically need to treat it, but we just do it as a precaution. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to monitor because we're always doing blood work to make sure we know where patients are. Um, okay, uh, testosterone, another one here for testosterone. So now we're talking about testosterone and we're talking about the side effect as an estrogen, elevated estrogen level. So, um, and by the way, um, sorry, before I move on, the this can happen in both men and women uh, with the high red blood cell counts, but it's far more likely to happen in men because we use higher doses in men. Um, now, testosterone level can increase estrogen levels, and this is largely only an issue in men, but not completely. It's just kind of the majority of the cases um, because we don't want estrogen levels to be too high in men, right? There's a kind of a threshold. Whereas women, usually when you're adding testosterone in, yes, you are gonna get some conversion of the testosterone to estrogen, but women's capacity to handle estrogen levels uh, at a higher level, it, that's normal for their physiology. It's not normal for a man's physiology. And so uh, things that can happen is a man can notice breast centeredness. They may be uh, more prone to weepiness, depression, anxiety. They more have, may have an increase in breast tissue, which we call uh, gynecomastia, or we affectionately call man boobs. Uh, uh, they may have more water retention, uh, and they may cause infertility. And so, sounds like bad stuff, but it's actually pretty easy to prevent. Uh, one is you have to dose appropriately, right? We're not trying to dose someone into, you know, bodybuilding ranges. We just want to dose them back to where they were in their 20s. Uh, and so, if you pay attention to your dosing and dose safely, which we always do here at Joy Wellness, um, then we generally don't have issues here. And if we do have that kind of rare case where we do have any of these symptoms arise, you know, it's common, the common ones would be maybe, uh, you know, some water retention or maybe some breast tenderness. Um, occasionally we do see a weepy patient, but that's overall pretty rare. Uh, then we simply can either lower the dose or we can, uh, or we routinely prescribe something called DIM. And I'm going to bring that up next. Here it is here. So DIM, uh, which uh, is a basically just an extract from broccoli. Uh, but you'd have to eat truckloads of broccoli to get the amount of DIM that you can get in a capsule. So still eat your broccoli. It's a super, super healthy uh, food, but DIM is a way to get it in a concentrated form uh, and, uh, and, and help prevent some of the issues that we have, that we just showed above. We routinely recommend DIM as part of any, any sort of estrogen or testosterone therapeutic program, just as a precaution that our primary goal is to create safety as we treat and try to improve human health. All right. So I'm going to skip this one. So actually, I apologize. I meant to delete this from the uh, slideshow. Um, I will touch on this a little bit. That's why uh, 
that slide was supposed to be deleted. Um, so hormone safety, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. Now I'm broadening this to, to going beyond testosterone. We are talking about all the, all the hormones here. So one of the common things that you know a provider will say is don't take hormones because they're going to cause cancer. Okay, so here's, here's the story on cancer, right? One is we don't think that hormones cause cancer. You have hormones in your body from day one. Uh, and so it would be strange that we were born with something that is part of normal physiology that is also causing cancer. Uh, two, um, the, the scenario where we do see a problem with cancer is when cancer is currently uh, exists in the body and whether you're producing it yourself from natural production or you're putting in the body from an external source, uh, if, if the cancer has a sensitivity to uh, progesterone or estrogen, then it, it, that can cause it to grow. So if the person has existing cancer, we almost never use hormones. Um, and so that's part of their due diligence at the beginning with their safety is to make sure that we run blood work and make sure people are up to date with their mammograms. And uh, we check the prostate uh, blood test and we check the, uh, we have a female do a well woman exam, breast exam, pap smear. And then we know that we're working with at least to the best of our knowledge, a baseline of no cancer. And then we feel like we're starting off on a, on a good foot. We also take a personal history of, of cancer and a family history of cancer to kind of understand a little bit about the genetics as well. And if someone is really concerned, there is some advanced genetic testing that we can run uh, to see if they have BRCA genes and so forth. But the average person, I would say, is generally not asking for that. So we only do that uh, upon request. Um, so our goal is to make sure clean slate, no cancer, to the best of our knowledge. And then, uh, then we can kind of uh, potentially green light the patient for, for therapy. All right. So uh, in general, as I said, medically clear patients before starting therapy, uh, do not treat people with active cancer. Uh, we use bioidentical hormones. So what that means is the hormones are generally being created from, they're either coming from biological source like a, uh, like a pig hormone would be a bioidentical thyroid hormone, uh, or it's coming from a yam or a plant source, which then they're creating and turning that into something like testosterone, estrogen. And so those would be your bioidentical hormones. They are at they are similar or, or I'm sorry, exactly structurally the same as what your body makes. And so that would make sense to use something that your body is already used to. Uh, and there are some interesting studies that show that while synthetic hormones and, and bioidentical hormones don't have any different uh, impact on how effective they are, they both do the same thing in terms of you know, treating symptoms and making people feel better, but they, there's less side effects overall with bioidentical hormones. Uh, so there's a, a better safety profile. So we use only bioidentical hormones. Occasionally we'll use, we'll use a synthetic um, uh, testosterone if someone wants to do an injectable. Um, but again, we can uh, keep the, that safe by taking all the other precautions as well. Um, and another principle is we always balance estrogen and progesterone. So when we have a female and we're doing estrogen, we always do progesterone. And so we keep that in a natural balanced state. Uh, and then estrogen, we never use an oral form. We find that the historical studies when they studied estrogen, uh, they were using an oral form, right? And so we found that if, if the, well, scientists who were doing the studies found that if they used topicals, that it did not, was not processed through the liver like the oral form is, and it has different impact on the body. And so again, it treats it the same, treats the body the same in terms of its impact, but there's a much better side effect profile uh, by using a topical route of estrogen or repellent route of estrogen uh, than using the, the oral form. And it's another way we keep people safe. So we've learned all these lessons through the years where we can really implement a really safe version of hormone therapy. And I think that's one of the primary differences between someone who's saying that horm hormones are dangerous and hormones are a really great therapy is which version are you talking about? Are you talking about the version from the 1970s and 60s or are you talking about the version uh, you know, in 2021? Uh, so it's important to kind of have be up to date on all the, the clinical data. And then, so again, how do we keep people safe? Uh, we always do baseline blood work. Uh, so we know where we're starting. We always do baseline diagnostic screening. That's the, the mammogram, pap smear, uh, digital rectal exam in certain cases. Uh, we also take personal history and family history, which I've already kind of touched on. Uh, and then we make sure that we dose appropriately, even uh, hair underdosing. Uh, to make sure that we're not going too high and create a good experience and we can always go up if we need to. Uh, we do blood work six weeks out. And what that does is it, it tells us, you know, now that you've been on therapy for six weeks, are we hitting the ranges we were hoping to with our initial dosing strategy? And if not, we can make alterations from there. Uh, it also kind of shows us if any of the other markers that we run for safety uh, are, are kind of uh, showing and then we can address them as well. So, you know, like everything else, you know, we, we just simply have to have the, the, the monitoring 
aspects in place and you monitor the therapy. We want to provide you or treat you with an antifungal because you have a fungal infection. We have to monitor your liver enzymes. It's the same, same principle. We know that there's a side effect with an antifungal. And so we monitor for that. With hormones, it's the same thing. We, we know there can be side effects and we monitor for those side effects. We find them, we address them. And they're generally reversible because you stop the hormone and then you know, the, the origin of the issue uh, kind of goes down. Um, let's see. And then we also do annual or biannual uh, complete blood series. So that's kind of just to do your, your full, full check-ins. Um, and then of course the screening uh, test, which we, which I've already mentioned. So that's how we create safety. Um, this is not, again, not comprehensive. There are other things out there um, that, that, you know, can happen, but I really touched on the major controversial pieces. Um, there's still data on, on cardiovascular disease, on things that support both sides um, and, and other areas as well. But uh, overall, I am a, a big advocate of hormones when it's done appropriately. Uh, and all the safety precautions are used for patients. And of course, if we can do anything on the side of that Dr. Mulcahy touched on at the beginning in terms of pre preventing the origin of any of these issues aside from the aging process, you know, certainly that's only going to benefit the person. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to question and answers and uh, we can go there. Wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you for those wonderful presentations and information. Um, one of our questions we got was what potential risks do you see with hormone therapy, um, which I think uh, we can safely say, Dr. McNally, you covered that um, pretty thoroughly. So unless there's anything else that you feel like you would want to cover, I think that one was covered already. Um, another one we have is what is the best way to assess my hormone levels? So Dr. McNally, do you agree that's just starting with the blood work? So yeah, best way to assess. I mean, yes, I, I think your, your, your primary assessment is going to be understanding what your levels are currently at. And there's more than one way of doing it in terms of, you know, which vehicle, blood or saliva, you know, di different ways of testing. But I don't think there is any one way. And I've never had an issue with blood, but I have used urine and saliva and other scenarios. Um, I think it's important to just know where you're at with the numbers and then you can compare before and after treatment. I think that's the most important part. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. And then uh, another one is, do timed release products work better since they provide hormones throughout the day and not with one big burst? I think it depends on the type of hormone. I definitely like the sustained release for melatonin. Um, for sleep, it, it, it just kind of depends. In, in general, I don't use sustained release for other hormones, but certainly you can. I don't know what your thoughts are, Dr. McNally. Yeah, I, I likewise, I do like sustained release for melatonin, especially if people are having issues with waking throughout the night, right? To have that kind of continuous melatonin release is really nice. Uh, or if they're more concerned about the quality of their sleep, I, I, I like the SR version. Um, the, in terms of the sex hormones, uh, you've got three basic different applications. You've got, um, well, progesterone is only oral and topical, but again, I, I think you miss some of the benefits of progesterone if you're not using oral. Uh, with testosterone, you can do pellet, you can do injection, or you can do cream. Um, your sustained release really is going to be your pellet because you're putting that in the system and then it's being released over time you know, say three to four months for a female and say, you know, five to six months for a male. So you do get a nice steady state. Uh, whereas injections, it's inherently it's a bolus dose. And basically what we do with injections to try to minimize the bolus dosing uh, is we inject smaller amounts twice a week. So while you do get a blip, it's a blip followed by only a couple few days and then another little blip. And so it creates more of a steady state overall, but, you know, uh, you know, not quite as much as, as your a steady state from uh, the uh, pellet. And then of course your cream can be a fairly steady state as well. There, there are some variabilities, you know, you didn't remember to do it every day. Uh, so there can be some instability based on, you know, the person who's applying it or, uh, you know, making sure they're, they're putting the right amount on stuff like that. So some user error can, can play a role, but I'd say overall, as long as somebody is okay with creams and does well with those, they can be another uh, useful option. Hey. Thank you. Um, maybe Dr. Mulcahy, if you don't mind doing this one, it's um, do, do addictions to drugs, sex, alcohol, make it difficult to get results? 
Yeah, I think that kind of comes back to the the foundation and the root cause. So addictions don't necessarily impact hormones directly. And it's sort of like what what is causing people to have the addictions? And if NAD levels are low, if we don't have um, adequate methylation cofactors, for example, our metabolic processes aren't going to work well. So I think anytime we're treating anyone with any hormone, we always want to be thinking about all those underlying things that can be contributing to the hormones not being optimal. And we approach everything, you know, precision medicine, each, each patient individually. So we look at you individually and, you know, what's going to help you. And that will be different from the next person. So, um, you know, depending on what, what is where the addiction is from, if it's from like a head injury that caused brain inflammation and gut inflammation, maybe what we need to do is um, address the gut first. So it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated question. Good question though. I'll add something as well. Um, one of the observations that I have seen in clinical practice as well as I've read about in the research is that when someone has like a traumatic brain injury or concussion or uh, you know, someone who is an alcoholic who's you know, drinking a, a lot of alcohol, uh, that can impact our ability to produce pregnenolone, which is kind of our, our mother hormone or kind of our master hormone. And so I have seen clinically those levels of these super, super low in someone who's an alcoholic or super low in someone who's had these, these injuries uh, that Dr. Fahey was talking about. And so that is one that I have seen have a direct kind of correlation to uh, drugs, I guess, in this case with the alcohol. Perfect, thank you. And I'll just um, add in a question I get a lot from patients is if I start this process, um, do I have need to do it for the rest of my life? I can jump in on this one. I, I always approach everyone that I start on hormones, particularly if it's someone who is not advanced age with the idea of, hey, we're gonna give you this support to help your metabolic processes work optimally. And we're gonna figure out why the, optim the hormones are not optimal. And we're gonna work to optimize them from the root up. And, and so, you know, there, if someone's postmenopausal, if someone's you know, man is much older and they're just not producing hormones, then they might need to be on them for the rest of their lives. But we get lots of people who, you know, are in their thirties and, uh, we can, we can certainly optimize the hormones without necessarily them being on the hormones the rest of their life or potentially start on a higher dose and then go down. And it's, it's never like, you know, start a prescription and you're going to be on this forever. We're constantly, you know, checking the levels and adjusting as necessary. Perfect. Thank I agree. You. I mean, when you can, uh, whenever you can get somebody to produce on their own biologically and feel really good, I mean, who doesn't want that? That's, that's less resources you're expending and, uh, you know, less interventions and so forth. So it's, it's a great thing. Um, and so that's, if we can get there, that's always the goal. Uh, and I think the younger you are, the more likely that is to happen. If you're, you know, in your eighties, it's probably going to be unlikely. Makes sense. <laughs> um, and then just um, another uh, nice comment. They, um, someone said, thank you for taking the addiction question seriously. Um, it's helping more people than you know. So um, we absolutely want to take everything very seriously here. Everyone that's going through anything we want to help. Um, and, you know, addiction is a, a rough thing to go through. And I think, you know, with the other services we offer as well, ketamine and stuff like ganglion blocks and all kinds of things, um, we're able to, you know, help in many different ways. So hormones can just be a starting point, but um, it's wonderful knowledge. And I thank you so much, Dr. Mulcahy and Dr. McNally for joining us today and giving us your time. And um, we'll follow up. Oh, we have one more question. Could you talk about increasing serotonin levels? Yeah, I mean, that's complicated as well. But I think my quick answer is that serotonin is, a lot of it is actually produced in the gut. And uh, I think people think of serotonin as being a brain hormone, but it's produced in the gut. And if we have, I, I did a talk last month, I think on the microbiome, if your gut is disrupted and inflamed, you're not going to produce enough serotonin. So that's kind of like a very brief um, answer to a more complicated question. The gut is just the foundation of so much in terms of our health. 
Yeah, and and again, we do you know all the extensive gut testing as well if we're we want to go down that route too. So so yeah, I think uh, it seems like that might be all. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to the doctors and everybody. Have a wonderful day and contact us with any other questions you may have. Thanks for coming.